we'll go through some theoretical stuff, but not a lot. I mainly just want to be able to go through some common AKGs with you guys and make sure that people understand some of the basics. And, uh, you know, then as you have more uh, exposure to EKGs, you can always build on that. So as we get started, we talked about what we're doing. And these are the ECG regions uh, in terms of uh, territories here. Uh, so these are the leads, and that's pretty self-explanatory from that standpoint. Uh, something that I wanted to make sure that we are all on the same page about is uh, coronary territories. And that's going to be relevant later, as you'll see. So this here, 1 and AVL plus V5 and V6, that's a lateral territory. Usually thought of a circumflex, uh, but there's uh, anatomical variability there. But anyway, that's the thinking there. So 2, 3, and AVF being inferior, uh, that's usually more RCA. And uh, here, uh, anterior would be V3 and V4. Uh, septal V2, although that's really prone to lead placement and so forth. So that's uh, the territory. It's just reviewing that for you guys when we um, look at some uh, coronary artery disease EKGs. Another one that's pretty common in terms of what you'll see is the difference between a right bundle branch block, a left bundle branch block, and an interventricular conduction delay. And th this is almost just like, just, just kind of having a picture of them in your, in your head, at least from a practical standpoint. You know, a left bundle branch block, this is the morphology in one. Uh, it's, it's deeply inverted for the R, the R wave in V1. And then V6 has a morphology that mirrors one. Uh, if you contrast that to a right bundle branch block, uh, you can see that it's going up in V1. See the difference between those. And uh, you have this, this kind of thin, deep S wave uh, rather than the, the T wave that you see uh, in, um, in the left bundle branch block. So you see those characteristics. Uh, usually by knowing what things look like in one V1 and V6, you'll have a good sense as to whether you're dealing with a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block. And obviously you have to have a QRS length that's uh, 120 or greater uh, to qualify for either of these. Uh, so if you have, sometimes, you know, you have a conduction uh, delay uh, that doesn't really uh, fit into either of these. And uh, sometimes it's a mixture of some of the characteristics. And then in that context, if you don't have that consistent uh, appearance, then it would be an interventricular conduction delay. It's kind of, it can be kind of like between the two of them, if that makes sense. All right, so that's a little bit of an oversimplification, but it gives you a really good tool to be able to assess these as you go on clinically. So I wanted to start with the first case. Uh, this is an 85-year-old woman with palpitations. Um, and, you know, as, as we go through the EKGs, I mean, you'll see some of the via examples. You know, so a lot of people give lectures as to what part of the EKG you should do first, and you should develop your own algorithm. But I think part of it, part of that is really knowing what to look for in particular cases. Uh, so, so that's kind of, that's what we want to achieve. And I've kind of uh, laid these out and you'll see what I mean. So if you, if you have an 85 year old woman with palpitations, you know, the history is very important, the CKGs. Uh, and that's a little bit of a trick for you guys, you know, really uh, try and see, you don't look at the EKGs in isolation, but see what's going on clinically. That's going to give you a big hint as to what might, going on, might, 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 what might be going on in the EKG. So do we have any takers here as to what this might be and how you would approach this EKG? So let me see here, does anyone, I think you guys can raise your hands in here potentially. Uh, so for example, uh, so any, any takers, um, I guess it'll be hard for you guys to really be able to say, depending on who people are. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of keep on going through them uh, unless people want to stop me at some point. So what you see in the CKG is that it's, it's an irregular pattern, it's narrow complex. So whenever you have a narrow complex, um, in this case, tachycardia, uh, that is irregular. Uh, atrial fibrillation is, is immediately in your differential. 
Uh, and then what you're looking for in that case is whether you see any P waves or not. Uh, so the main point uh, with this EKG was to see whether there was any consistent P waves that you might be able to see. So somebody might say, well, is this a P wave? Is this a P wave? Is this a P wave? Well, if you look at, if you, if you look at this, you realize that these are just, uh, you know, this organized electrical activity. There isn't anything consistent uh, across this lead here that you would, might be able to call a P wave. There, there could be some little dips and bumps here and they're masquerading as such, but nothing that you could really march out and that would constitute a P wave. So then if you have absence of P waves and you have disorganized electrical activity in the atria, and uh, hence uh, you have the irregularly uh, irregular rhythm that you see here uh, and the tachycardia. So that's the first one. So does anyone have any questions about that? I'm not sure if I can get a sense as to whether people have questions or not. Can is that everybody hear me okay or? Yeah, we can. Okay, great. So I'll keep on going. Uh, Uh, so then this is a 65 year old woman again with palpitations. So, uh, what might be going on here? It kind of looks like there are some flutter waves. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you can see the flutter waves in two, three and ABF. Uh, and that's pretty classic, you know, uh, downward going in those leads there. Uh, and you know, flutter, but, but they but they both have palpitations, right? But in this case, you have a, a regular rhythm, uh, which usually flutter is, although you can have variable block. Uh, and then you have this uh, upward going uh, P, uh, uh, atrial activity in V1, downward going here. That tells us this is typical flutter. So it's really a uh, circuit in the cable of tricuspidismus. Uh, and that's on the right side of the heart, as we can see here. So this is the IVC, uh, and this is where the IVC really joins the right atrium here. Uh, and then this is a tricuspid annulus here. So this here is the cable tricuspid isthmus here. And basically you have this current going, just really just going around here. And it's very, very treatable. We have a, a high 90 uh, cure rate for a typical flutter because as you might imagine, it's very easily accessible. That's just a, a, a venous stick going up to the IVC and just burning this circuit here. And that cures typical flutter. So that's why it's important to get a sense as to whether you're dealing with a fib, which would be on the left side of the heart and it's harder to address, but it is addressable from an electrophysiologic uh, standpoint. But then um, typical flutter, which is a little bit easier. Uh, but nevertheless, as we keep on going here, we have a 50 year old gentleman with resolving palpitations. It's a nice EKG, this one. And uh, so I'll, uh, so you have that flutter with variable block here, and then you can see um, that the patient self-converts. Um, and then you have sinus rhythm following with some PACs. So you can kind of see the progression here. Um, great. So I'll keep on going and I, uh, here we are gonna go in a little bit of a slightly different tune here and I will try to get some participation here. Uh, so this is a 71 year old gentleman with chest pain and shortness of breath. What might we be seeing? Chase, what do you think? Dr. Vargas, I'll try to get some uh, participation. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It's, uh, it's always, uh, it's, it's easier for people to hide, you know? <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, so we'll, so we'll give you, um, uh, we'll give you a sense of what's going on in this one here. So obviously very obvious ST elevations. I hope that was clear to folks. When you look at ST elevations, you're comparing uh, the TP segment to the ST segment. You see this, so that's usually the most reliable isoelectric, isoelectric baseline, AKG. You can 
or ST elevation or ST depression, as the case might be, by first establishing what the isoelectric baseline is. And in this case, there is a uh, very clear elevation, several millimeters. Uh, and uh, so what territory would this be encompassing? We just went through that before. We might get something in the chat. Let's see. Yeah. Maybe people will be more amenable. To two North that. says LAD. Look at that. Two North. Good job, Two North. Looks All like right. a future cardiologist. That's right. That's right. We might have a ringer there. Uh, so, so, yeah. So that is LAD. Now, what area would be represented here? That's two, three, and ABF. Because I will give away to you that there are ST elevations there also, as you can see, after you establish your isoelectric baseline there. You can see those clear ST elevations in this three leads here. In this three leads here. So what uh, area is that? Maybe two north wants to give it a shot. We have a couple. It says, someone says inferior RCA, another one says RCA. Good, good job, guys. Yeah, that's exactly right. So now, what do you guys think is going on? What's possible? You have LAD, you have RCA, this is a STEMI, obviously, so we're thinking this is an acute occlusion or whatever vessel we think, or vessels as the case might be. So what do you guys think is the most plausible anatomical explanation of this STEMI in terms of what's getting occluded? What vessel would you say? Because you might think, wait, the RCA plus the LED, what do you guys think might be going on? So just take a guess. You guys can, just like you said before, what vessel? So I'll, I'll give you a little help here. So the LED can sometimes be very large and it can wrap around the apex. So if you have a proximal occlusion in the LED, if it's a very important vessel with not a lot of collaterals, you can also see ST elevations in the inferior lead that is all related to that one lesion, which is obviously a very ominous lesion for the patient, right? Because it encompasses a very large amount of myocardial territory. So that's what we're uh, looking at there. So thank you for the participation there. We will move forward. So, uh, and by the way, there will be a few uh, ST elevation cases and so forth. We might skip some of them once we, uh, you know, just for the sake of the format that we're using, but also um, uh, just to move on to some of the other points as well. So this is a 72 year old uh, gentleman with chest pain and shortness of breath, and again, that story is so important, right? A 72-year-old male with chest pain, you're thinking coronary disease, right? Uh, that, that really needs to be one of the first things you're think, thinking about just based on the demographic, right? And particularly, obviously, if you're looking at this particular EKG. So I'm going to focus it a little bit more. Do you guys see any ST elevations in this EKG? No. No. Okay. Well, I am glad that I am showing it to you. Uh, so, so, so then you can see that there is inferior ST segment elevation here. Now it's very important for you to establish your isoelectric baseline, right? Because, and that's why it's so important to go from the TP, right? So that's your isoelectric baseline here. If you run that across, right? You know, and again, I'm not using the PR because that can be depressed. So if you're, you know, in like pericarditis and things like that. So you want to do your isoelectric baseline, which in this case is the TP, and then you see that there's clear elevation if you go across like that. You have to ignore that, that, that T wave inversion, there, right? So then you have a scenario in which these are called what, guys? So instead of the R wave going up, you have a blank wave going down. Two waves. Yes. So you have Q waves, you have ST elevations, you have T wave inversions, right? So this is an evolving inferior ST elevation MI, clearly not brand new, correct? So, uh, so this is uh, inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now I have a question for you guys. Um, what is the rhythm in this EKG? It's a bit of a loaded question. Let me ask you this. Oh, but is the PR segment the same everywhere, or does the PR segment vary? How's that for a question? It varies. 
Great, great. Uh, so we all agree there are ST segment elevations. We all agree there are Q waves. We all agree there are T wave inversions. And we all agree that's the inferior territory, right? And now we have a scenario in which the PR is varied. Uh, now, why might you have PR, you know, we can characterize what we mean by the PR varying, obviously, but why, 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 why might that be the case in an inferior STEMI? Oh, but Swan. Yeah, well, you know, you're, you're, the RCA a lot of times supplies the AV node, right? So, so if you have a, a STEMI involving the RCA, you might completely knock off the AV node, right? And it's just something to think about because you look at the CKG and the first thing is recognizing the, the RST segment elevations, right? Once you recognize that, then, you know, and that goes back to having a system for your EKGs. Usually the first thing we look at when we look at an EKG is, are there P waves, you know? <laughs> because if there are P waves and they're upwards here and upwards here, then that's probably sinus. So you're looking at sinus rhythm it could be sinus tachycardia, it could be sinus bradycardia, or it could be normal sinus rhythm. In this case, uh, there are P waves, but there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes, right? So then the question might be, why is that the case, right? Uh, so somebody said move it, you know, uh, so that has to do with uh, a prolonged PR and do, do, do people feel like we see a type of Mobitz here? And if so, why? So the PR interval is gradually prolonging. Excellent. And, and that could, could be very nicely seen here, right? Uh, so this is prolonging, this is prolonging, and then there's a missed beep here, right? That one is not conducting. So conduction is getting worse, 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 and then there's no conduction, right? And then it resumes again. That's Moet's one. That is something that can certainly be seen in the context of uh, RCA infarcts. Uh, but you can have, I guess my point before was you can have something a little more sinister where you actually have a complete heart block and you may actually even need a pacemaker uh, in order to stabilize a patient with an RCA infarct. And that's something just to be aware of because it's important to recognize that early, if that makes sense to you guys. Okay. So... 73-year-old gentleman with new onset neurological deficit. Now, you guys might be wondering, why are we talking about a neurological deficit in an EKG lecture? And, and that's the point. The answer to that question is the point of this EKG. What do you guys see? Are the T waves normal or not? No. no. So you have this deep T wave inversions, right? And... The differential for deep T wave inversions like that, uh, if you guys have heard of Wellens T waves, those could be an LAD impact, uh, deep T waves like that, uh, and or or very very proximal ischemia, you know, uh, not so much uh, infarct per se, but anyway, advanced either left main or proximal LAD disease, but uh, but this is also seen in the context of uh, neurological, acute neurological insults, uh, whether it's a brain bleed or whatever the case might be, in the absence of coronary disease. You know, so it's a phenomenon that sometimes can be seen in that particular context. And that's the point of this EKG is to go through, uh, go through the differential. So neurological uh, sequela is one of them, but then also advanced coronary disease is another one. Uh, something else that might masquerade as this would be something like stress cardiomyopathy uh, and even hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, although you would have a, more of an LVH signature than this, typically. Okay. What do you guys think about this? 24-year-old woman with postpartum cardiomyopathy and palpitations. And this is a, a situation in which the story really gives it away. So let me ask you a couple of pointed questions. Is this a narrow complex tachycardia or a wide complex tachycardia? It's obviously a tachycardia. I'm giving you that much. I think we all agree on that. Wide, wide right? So uh, given that history, what's high in your differential? What was that? Deep tap. 
Yes, that's exactly right. Because you have cardiomyopathy with a white complex tachycardia like that, that's regular. Uh, VTAC is high in your differential. So already, and I know there's a lot of tools for talking about VT and so forth. And, uh, and I, won't, I won't even go into this. I'm just kind of giving you what you can get at just putting the, you know, the fact that they have a cardiomyopathy, they have, the fact that they have a regular white complex tachycardia, and that really being a high index of suspicions for VT, right? Now, the other point to add is that if you have a white complex tachycardia, but it's very irregular, uh, really a big thing that you can do is look at the person's EKG, look at the prior EKG, and that's a big take because VT, if you, have, if you happen to have an EKG that is in sinus from prior, VT will have a different axis. It's coming from a different place in the heart, right? It's certainly not coming from the sinus. So it's gonna, it's gonna, the axis is going to shift. And in the context of a regular well complex like cardia with an axis shift and this kind of history, I mean, you're really uh, almost very, very sure that this is VT. Uh, so the other component is that if you see a bundle branch block or an interventricular conduction delay in the setting of sinus rhythm in the prior EKG, and then you're looking at an irregular EKG, sometimes we see a white complex tachycardia that's irregular in the context of atrial fibrillation. So it's just something to think about. But you see how you can arrive at that differential just really using pretty basic parts of the clinical history and the past medical history, EKGs included. Okay. So, what do you guys think about this one? 61 year old female, asymptomatic. This is a little bit of a trick question. And how do you explain this right here? You know, usually, this is to illustrate the, the concept of uh, 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 QRS prolongation. Uh, you know, in terms of um, uh, the R wave progression. So usually you go from a slower, from a lower, you know, smaller R wave to a gradually bigger R wave. A context in which you see that uh, going away could be obesity, could be lead placement, could be even LAD disease, you know, uh, as you might imagine. In this case, what you see is you have fairly large R, then it really drops here, then it starts to pick up again. And this is, a con this is an example of uh, lead placement. Uh, you know, so, so these two leads have been switched. So if you switch those, then you have a much more normal uh, QRS complex there. So that's, what, that's sort of illustrating the concept of, of what, what is expected our wave progression, but then also starting to troubleshoot the EKGs for lead placement issues, okay? Any questions about that? No, okay, so we will move on. All right. So I think we have done this long enough for you guys to take, just take a guess here as to what might be going on. Any takers? It's a 75 year old gentleman with diabetes. I was hoping that, that somebody would point that out. So 75 year old gentleman with diabetes and sudden chest pain. I think this is a crushing chest pain. No, it doesn't say crushing, but it could say crushing. So even before you look at the EKG, what are you thinking about? Am I? Yeah, that's right. So, it's, so, so what do you think about the ST segments here? <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So, so, so yeah, so this is a nice juicy STEMI, right? Uh, and this is a, a very big LAD lesion. You know, obviously look at your rhythm always. Look at all their leads. Uh, and uh, you can see that here, that doesn't seem to be a, uh, just, just, just PACs, that doesn't seem to be a, a sinister block of some sort, but that always, as we talked about before, keep an eye on those things as well. Okay, so you guys are doing pretty well here. All right, this is another, another etiology. I'm just giving you a hint. 34 year old gentleman with syncope. What can cause a 34 year old, let me just give it to you, Previously healthy, I could say, previously healthy, quote unquote, 34 year old gentleman with syncope. What's your differential, even before you look at the EKG? You know, if it was a cardiac thing. Oh, God. Yes, that's right, that's right. So you go into this EKG with that differential, and what do you see in this EKG that is pretty consistent with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? 
So LVH, right? So, so, so there's a good amount of LVH via EKG criteria. Uh, and there's also repolarization abnormalities as well. So with this kind of history, uh, what are, what's the next test that you would guys, you guys would do? Echo. That's right, get an echo, look at wall thickness. Now, I'm gonna make it a little harder for you. If the echo is not conclusive, what other tests can you do? Sometimes the echo is, is limited and you can't see the apex sometimes, or you, uh, there might be a region where you can, just can't see. Sometimes you can get around that by using definity contrast, uh, which are basically lipid, little lipid air bubbles that uh, helps reflect ultrasound uh, beams and it kind of opacif you know, helps us to opacify the LB and it uh, provides nice contrast with the uh, uh, myocardium. So if you haven't used that or if you use that and you really can't get a good view, what other tests can you do to really look at the thickness uh, uh, of the LV? MRI. That's right. That's right. So then, and then on top of that, you know, obviously if you're having syncope, right, uh, what is the concern somebody having syncope with Hocum? Thankfully it hasn't happened to them yet. That's right. Yeah, so that's why it's important. You see an EKG like this, you see this history, you want to make sure, do they have thick and hard, do they have scar by MRI? And maybe even doing some sort of monitoring to see whether there was an uh, VT or an arrhythmia that correlated with, uh, with a syncope. Remember okay, darkness? yeah, go there ahead. Are, there are also people answering in the chat. Just so oh, they know. are, okay, huh. thank you. Let me see, how can I, so people are answering in the chat. Let me see if I can. Oh, look, look, yeah, I got the chat. You know what? I had it, I hadn't pulled up the chat. Awesome, I got it now. Sorry, somebody asked another question. Hello? Okay. All right, so I got it now. So, so we will keep on going here. Um, okay. So now that I have the chat, you guys can answer that way also. Uh, so, okay, so this EKG reinforces some of, the, some of the concepts we had already talked about. But nevertheless, uh, what do you guys see here? 54-year-old gentleman with chest pain. What are you guys thinking about? Inferior setting. That's right. Well, yeah, that's right. You have ST elevation. So what do you see in lead one and AVL? Typical changes. That's right. So that's, uh, that's reciprocal changes from the STEMI. So, so then, you know, and it's just, this is a little bit of a technical point. And if you look a lot of STEMIs, you might notice this. But if you had to guess, sometimes uh, you have a, a CERC lesion, a, a CERC um, territory that, that really uh, encompasses the, most of the RCA territory, depending on uh, what, what the dominance pattern is and, you know, co-dominance and uh, the anatomical variations that might be involved. Uh, something that gives you a little bit of a hint uh, is when you have, and this is not 100%, but it's a cute thing that you can do is looking at the, uh, if, you, if you happen to have something like this, it's pretty impressive. See the magnitude here of the ST elevations in three uh, being greater than two, that gives you a sense that there's a, a likely an RCA rather than CERC. Uh, if it was the, way around, the other way around, you might be able to, uh, to guess the other way around. But yeah, this is a, 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 a RCA infarct and with reciprocal changes, right? Okay, so this is the same EKG. I'll give you that hint. So this is the prior one. This is the new one. What changes do you see here? So this is the prior EKG. Look at the ST segments here. This is the same patient. And look at the ST segments here. What is that? Do you see ST elevations in V, just to guide you a little bit, in V3, 4, 5, and 6? Yes? Yes. Somebody says yes. Okay. So, you know, this EKGs were done uh, within minutes of each other. So, obviously, nothing else has happened. So, what do these leads represent then? Anybody, anybody seen these before? So whenever you have an inferior MI, you really should have should do right-sided leads, right? Because if 
in, in, in association with the inferior MI, uh, there is also a RV infarct. Uh, the prognosis can be a lot worse. Uh, you know, RV infarcts can be a lot harder to, uh, to handle. So once the RV is impacted to that degree, uh, patients might be very fluid dependent and it could be, uh, they could get sicker pretty quick. So that's important to know. Um, and uh, uh, okay, so, so look at this. When would you do a, okay, so somebody, somebody, so VHC, who's VHC? I guess those are people that are uh, looking at us from hospital center, right? From Virginia hospital center, I guess. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, all right, so, so look, so we'll go through this and that, that's a really good question. So then there is the right-sided leads. There's also posterior leads, right? And I think uh, whoever that was at VHC almost stole my thunder there. Um, but let's go through the leads. So that's great. That's absolutely great. So the biggest thing is that you can do posterior leads. They kind of go behind you and I'll, uh, and I'll diagram them just now. So if you have an inferior MI, uh, you should look at right sider leads and posterior leads. And I'll show you some examples here. So these are regular lead placements, right? So I'm, I'm sure you guys have all seen this, but then you have V1 and V2, V3, V4, um, and V5 is six, as you see it there. Uh, so if you do right-sided leads, you're basically uh, really switching V1 and V2 around and then going towards the right side of the heart. So that's the right side of chest lead placement. Uh, so so, so that's, that's right-sided leads. So in that context, you know, so, so, so that basically what you have is V4, V5, and V6. Uh, and I'll go back so you can see them. Four, five, and six. So you can get elevations in those leads for that reason. And then, I, and then we have a couple of more example here. Uh, so, okay. So then we'll move on and we'll, we'll get to another, uh, to answer that other question that somebody uh, raised soon, I think is one of the lead, uh, questions coming up. So somebody with chest pain and cough for several days. Chest pain and cough, when you guys see that together, what are you guys thinking about that from a diagnostic standpoint? Uh, there's a lot of different things, but uh, let's say if I said to you that they had uh, a fever, cough, maybe rhinorrhea, and then two or three weeks later, they had this, uh, this chest pain, this positional chest pain. So obviously that's embellishing the, the story that I'm giving you a little bit more there. So what, yeah, somebody says pericarditis, that's right. So, so I'm trying to get you guys to the point where, as you've noticed, where you're really thinking about the history, really thinking about the clinical presentation, and using that information, really thinking about what the EKG used to look like in terms of past medical history, and then really analyzing the EKG with all of that information in mind. So and when you do that, uh, do you see any findings of uh, potential pericarditis in this EKG? And if so, what do you see? So some of the things that you see here, uh, if you, and again, I mentioned about the isoelec isoelectric, yeah, so somebody said diffuse ST elevation, that's, that sounds good. There's something else. Whoever said this, uh, diffuse ST elevations, uh, I'm going to challenge them to see if they see any other classical finding of pericarditis in the CKD. PR depressions, good job. Uh, all right, so if you get your isoelectric baseline, you know, we all agree. That's the TP segment that I told you guys about. And then that's the isoelectric baseline right there. So you can see if you do your isoelectric baseline here uh, and do it here, you know, you don't see it as much in these leads here, but you really definitely here, you start seeing some ST elevations, right? Then you see ST elevations uh, doing your isoelectric baseline here. So if you go across like this on your isoelectric baseline, you certainly have ST elevation, but by keeping that isoelectric base, baseline that I keep on talking about, you also have a, a PR depression. That's pretty obvious, you know? So, so you can see the ST is above this point, the uh, PR is below this point. So you have a really nice illustration here of diffuse ST elevations and PR depressions with a clinical history that is consistent with pericarditis. Any questions about that? All right, so we will move on. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so let's see here. 
Yeah. That's it. All right, guys. So I know that we've done some, some ST elevation in mind. So some, someone asked me a question, and I kind of gave you a hint just there, but going ahead, uh, before, uh, about an, uh, the lease. We talked about right-sided lease. We talked about posterior lease. Anyway, this is an inferior MI, and I already mentioned, I mean, you can see the ST elevations are so pretty clear now, so I won't belabor that point. Uh, and you can see the reciprocal changes in the lateral lease as well, which we see. Uh, you can also see evidence of ischemia anteriorly as well, V2 and V3. Now, big point here is the fact that obviously we would do right-sided leads. And when we look at right-sided leads, we're looking for ST elevations that, that, that in the right side, in the RV, that might be coin, you know, coming along with uh, the inferior ST elevations. And we do that uh, because of the prognostic significance of identifying a concurrent RV infarct infarction, as we talked about, right? Another type of leads that are very important and sometimes are forgotten, somebody um, brought that up already, are posterior leads, right? So if you look at the ST segments here, B5 and B6, they look pretty normal in this case, right? But this is an EKG from the same patient. And then you can see the leads here, V7, V8, and V9, right? So that's instead of four, five, and six, right? Uh, and then you might, and obviously we didn't change these leads here, so you still see the same ST elevations there and reciprocal changes. So you might wonder where these are coming from. So basically you take V4, V5, and V6, and you put them in the, you know, towards the back, you sort of kind of go around the patient there. And then in that sense, V4 becomes V7, and V5 becomes V8, and V6 becomes V9. So that gives you a look at the posterior side of the heart. So that when you look at inferior MIs, you want to look at the rhythm. You want to look at what else is involved, meaning the RV, and also meaning the posterior part of the heart. And that gives you a, a sense as to the severity and the prognosis of the uh, uh, MI. Uh, so, any, any, any questions about the leads, uh, RV leads, posterior leads? Now, I can tell you that I've had patients, and this has happened before, and it happened at Georgetown, actually. I gave this talk, and I think it was, I don't know if you, I forget who it was, but one of the residents saw this talk, and then they had a patient in the ED, and they were having chest pains, um, and I don't know if you guys remember that EKG that I just showed you that had ST elevations, and you guys weren't able to see them so, so well. That happens frequently. Sometimes they're even more subtle than that, right? So there was that kind of presentation. People didn't really see clear ST elevations and they did a posterior, they did a right side of one that didn't, they didn't see much there. But when they did that posterior lease, there were clear ST elevations that wouldn't really be, they would not have been readily seen uh, if the posterior leads had not been done. And then that patient uh, was flown to hospital center uh, emergently, had PCI and that was a, a good success story. But that's for you guys to, to kind of have seen uh, what these leads look like. They're not particularly difficult to place, and that's why I show you the diagrams, but that can really help you diagnostically when you're in the ED or uh, in the middle of the night. All right, so any questions about that? No, we'll keep on going then. Uh, so this is, uh, in any case, so what do you guys, so I am gonna take some, some comments on this one. So what do you guys think is going on here? So this is a 59-year-old patient with chest pain and becomes unresponsive during the ECG. V-fib, good, good. Uh, so, okay, V-fib. Why V-fib? Do you see anything else I might explain the V-fib in this EKG? I mean, by V-fib, you guys see the, uh, of course, V-fib there. That's pretty, pretty obvious. You, so somebody said torsades. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what do you see? I mean, this is. The, I mean, on, on the story, fifty-two-year-old gentleman with chest pain. What do you think caused the V-fib here? Yeah. Somebody said an MI. Tell me where. Can you see ST elevations anywhere? What lead? Yeah. So you have V5, and then you have V5. So there's somebody obviously that needs to have. It needs to be hopefully resuscitated and have PCI sooner rather than later. Um, but you know, that's why, I don't mean to scare you guys, but this is one of the reasons it's important to recognize the EKGs and start to get comfortable with uh, where the ST elevations might be, 
what are the leads you might want to do, uh, and what kind of the prognostic indicators that might be relevant that you can pick up. Okay, and I think that um, what and I think let me see let me see if we do uh, let's do one more then some questions and we'll probably call it at that point. Um, whoops, sorry. So press the wrong button here. Okay. So uh, if you look at this EKG right here, what are you guys thinking? Somebody said something that might be relevant to this before. So a 34-year-old wo uh, woman with nausea and vomiting, uh, renal tubular acidosis. Uh, so what do you guys see about this EKG that might be, first of all, in that context, uh, and I'll give you a hint, would you expect electrolyte disturbances in that context? Obviously the answer is yes, right? Have nausea and vomiting, uh, renal tubular acidosis. So in that context, what change might you have? What acute change might you have in the EKG? You know, and I'll leave that to somebody to answer uh, in terms of the intervals, you know, because that's the other component of it. You want to look at your PR interval, look at your QRS interval, but also look at your QT interval. So what do you guys think? Yeah, so the QTC is prolonged here. And this is what can happen. And this is the torsades that people were talking about, right? So uh, VT uh, with changing axis, right? Uh, this patient had very low electrolytes, thankfully with repletion of the electrolytes that, that resolved. But obviously they had a predisposition for this with the uh, renal tubular acidosis and so forth. All right. And this is a, a pretty cool website here uh, where um, credible meds, medications that might induce uh, towards, uh, a, uh, prolonged acuity. And um, uh, it's a pretty useful website. And I, I usually uh, when we get called in consults, we let the, the consulting team know, the people that are requesting the consults about this website. Some people already know about it, but you can go through the medications that your patients is on, that your patients are on, and they can give you a sense of the risk for uh, QT prolongation and the interactions in that context. 